those that I don't know, I'm Joanne and I work in the support and information team with Louise, who is to my left. Um, just to say that uh, you're all on mute at the moment, or you were, if you could just mute yourselves whilst Dave and Barbara are talking, it just cuts down on background noise. Also to let you know that we're recording this uh, webinar so we can put it up on our YouTube channel. So if you don't want to be seen, just turn your video off, please. Um, there'll be a chance to ask questions to Dave and Barbara at the end. If you'd like to ask a question, just use the chat function. Just let me know that you want to ask a question and then we can ask you to put it to them at the end of the talk. Um, so that's it from me. I'll pass you over to Louise now, who's going to introduce Dave and Barbara. Thanks, Jo. So today marks our 11th support information webinar like this, and we couldn't be prouder to welcome our two speakers today. So almost 35 years ago to the day, Dave completed two years of chemotherapy for Ewing sarcoma. So Ewing sarcoma is the second most commonly diagnosed primary bone cancer in children and young adults after osteosarcoma. And it can start anywhere in the body, but most often is found in the pelvis, the chest and in the bones of the legs. Fewer than 100 cases in the UK and Ireland are diagnosed each year and it accounts for around 1.5% of all childhood cancers. So today we're joined by Dave and his wonderful wife Barbara, who BCRT have become to know really well through their involvement with our community of supporters. Dave and Barbara are here with us to reflect on their journey with primary bone cancer as a family almost 40 years on and how finding accurate information and others who could truly understand was a turning point for them. So Dave and Barbara, thank you so much and we'll hand over to you. Lovely, thank you. Uh, thanks very much indeed for that Louise and uh, Joanne. So uh, yeah, it's an absolute privilege to be asked to uh, do this. So yeah, we've got to, a lot to cover. So we're going back, uh, as Louise said, nearly 40 years. Yeah. So um, just, uh, the, just before I was diagnosed, I was working in the uh, fork truck industry as a sales engineer. Um, I had two daughters, uh, one age three, one age five. Oh. So that was probably a full, full time job as well. And um, in my spare time, uh, I was playing drums in a band. I've uh, been playing in bands since the 60s, something uh, I was very passionate about. And also played a lot of squash, probably playing two or three times a week, because it was a very popular game in those days. And in fact, I was due that year, 1983, I was part of the squash club team to run the Nottingham Half Marathon. However, I'd been getting some pain in my knee, intermittent pain, and I went to see the GP two, three times maybe. I did have an x-ray of the knee and they said, can't see anything wrong with it. Each time I went, they said, uh, they've probably got loose ligaments, whatever that may be, and suggested I wear a support when I was playing squash. So yeah, try the support, didn't work. And consequently decided to not bother with it and just carry on and put up with the pain, which was gradually getting worse. And then one evening in October 1983, I was away from home on business down in Suffolk, had a game of squash with a colleague, then woke up in the early hours of the morning, and this time the pain was absolutely horrific. And uh, I even ran a hot bath to try and put my leg in it to try and ease the pain. That didn't seem to do anything, took some mild painkillers. Then somehow or another, the following morning, I managed to drive home back to Nottinghamshire, about a two and a half drive in agony got home, abandoned the car out front into the house and just said, please help. Mm. Well, it's right. I had seen Dave in, in some pain previously, but today the pain I could see him in was obviously excruciating. So the GP was called and I arranged for the GP to get into the house because we weren't going to be there. I was about to take our daughters to a birthday party. So house unlocked, Dave in bed, excruciating, rolling around the bed and daughters and I disappeared to come back and find that the doctor had visited and he'd recommended rest to lay off squash for a couple of weeks. Just two weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, and some painkillers. Yeah, so, so I think we called him back we a couple did. of days later mm. and uh, no improvement whatsoever. And he uh, sent us off to A&E with a letter. Um, pretty much the same there. Uh, I might have at some point had a 
x-ray of the whole leg yeah but they couldn't find anything wrong basically said there's nothing we can do gave me some stronger painkillers and we were sent home we went back to a and &E, I think again mm -hmm. maybe two or three days later and by this time I couldn't walk uh, you were pushing me around in a wheelchair and they um, at that point sent us to a sports injury specialist at the general hospital in Nottingham which is right in the middle of Nottingham um, by this time I was pretty much out of it due to the painkillers I was on mm -hmm. so you remember that appointment better than me yes uh, we were in a, a room waiting for the consultant to appear and I'd taken to attending consultations with Dave because he was either in pain or not able to remember things and ask okay. questions so we felt it needed the two of us there both obviously he needed to be there but for somebody to understand what else was happening so the sports injury consultant came in with a posse of medical students and between them they answered questions and examined Dave physically and his x-ray and the consultant came to the conclusion that there could be a stress fracture he'd identified a hot spot maybe an abscess he prescribed crutches for Dave and he was given some instruction there and then on how to use crutches which is a good thing really yeah. because he couldn't put weight on his left leg then and also an appointment to go to the orthopaedic department at the Queen's Medical Centre later on that day so, so that made us think <laughs> yeah it's an urgent appointment so alarm bells must have been ringing yeah we saw an orthopaedic consultant and uh, he had a look at the x-ray examined me and said right let's get you in for a bone biopsy a minor operation and you'll probably be in and out in the day at worst overnight so I think we waited a few days for that mm -hmm. um, into the Queen's Medical Centre uh, admitted in the morning had surgery in the afternoon and when I woke up I looked under the blanket at my leg and I thought I ain't going home tonight and um, <laughs> There was pipes, a great big bandage, and uh, there was a wound on my leg. I think we've measured it about 20 centimetres, half the length of the femur. And they'd opened the leg up, cut through all the muscle on the thigh, and gave us the impression they'd removed an abscess from the bone. So I was stuck in bed for two or three days. They managed to get me up and about on crutches. And then I was told that the consultant wanted to see me one evening when you were visiting. Mm -hmm. You remember that, don't you? I do, yes, yes. We were all four of us trooped into the room to see Mr. Howe, the orthopaedic consultant. And he was very concerned because our younger daughter had chosen to wear a very pale ballet outfit for this occasion. So between them, the pair of them had got books and colouring things, but the younger daughter was sat on the floor and Mr. Howe was really rather concerned that she get rather dirty. This was a hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway that was the least of our concerns as we were about to find out yeah so as then i got the diagnosis that it was ewing sarcoma in my left femur that meant absolutely nothing to me never heard of it never even heard of bone cancer and uh, the word ewing's was familiar in as much that um we're back in the early 80s then and dallas was on television jr ewing was the main character in that so i thought well at least some people will have heard of it and as I recall it, he followed that up with an interesting statement and he said, it's not cancer as such. And that sort of statement is wrong with me and I've never really understood it. And it gave me the impression it wasn't anything particularly serious. And there was no internet then, there weren't even file faxes, so we couldn't find any information about, about it. I think we found one sentence in the library in the book and it just mm. said, um, a type of bone cancer mainly affecting uh, young people. So that's all we knew about it. So um, eventually, yes, yeah, after a couple of days, I think a consultant called Dr. Sockle, an oncology consultant, came to see me to describe what treatment I will be having. Prior to that, also, I'd had a bone marrow sample taken. We won't talk about that. That's very <laughs> uncomfortable, that is. And Dr. Sockle said I would be um under him at the general hospital in nottingham that's the same hospital i had the uh, senior sports injury specialist and i'd be having chemotherapy every three weeks for two years and also uh radiotherapy for three weeks and 
at some point also some nurses came to see me with information about where I'd be having the chemotherapy and I don't know why but I kept these books they gave me these books nearly 40 years ago there's one here and there's another about radiotherapy here and little things like before chemotherapy not to eat a heavy meal take that advice on and if I was to feel ill at any time to speak to the nurse and she would give me something to make me feel better and they said that um, the place where we would be staying was um, on a row called the rope walk opposite the general hospital I said you'll probably be an inpatient there while you're having your treatment I says it's a nice friendly place and there's a photograph here if this actually works Not one there. Oh, wrong, pushing push the wrong button. There we go. This is the back of the building. Obviously, this is summertime, and this, this was winter time when I was diagnosed. And she says, This is what it's like. And in fact, she says, Some of the patients, if they're not feeling too bad in the evening, um, they have a walk into town. And there's a famous pub in Nottingham, the old trip to Jerusalem, supposedly the oldest pub in the country. And some of them will walk down there and have a, have a beer. Mm. Well, I'm 32 years old and I'm thinking, hmm, this sounds like fun. So I was actually quite looking forward to it. I thought we might have a bit of fun when we got there. But it didn't turn out like that, did it? Didn't, no. So <clears throat> I was went into the general hospital early November for my first round of chemotherapy. And weren't you on Saturday? I think so. Yeah, had a few tests on Saturday and then on the Sunday I was due to have my uh, chemotherapy. It was a Sunday afternoon. Prior to that, the lunch trolley came round and I had a nice big portion of shepherd's pie, vegetables, rhubarb crumble and custard. Nobody warned me what would happen. Right. And I had my chemotherapy about five o'clock and the drugs I had then, certainly doxorubicin, I know I had that for the first time. and also I phosphamide and vincristine, I can't remember the other drugs, but then they're actually administered straight into the vein on the back of the hand, which over a period of time got to be very painful and uncomfortable. But you were there for the first chemo. Yes, daughters yeah. and I were visiting on the Sunday afternoon when the doctor arrived with a clear plastic bag with um, the drugs he was going to administer to Dave. And he advised that we vacate the bed because should any of the drugs escape their capsules then they could be quite damaging to us so that gave me something to think about yeah so yep had the first chemo around about five o'clock um then that evening i went to sit in the day room with some of the other patients by this time i'd realized i was seriously ill because of the type of ward i was on and um so I sat in this day room with other cancer patient patients and they're all smoking away. The room is thick with tobacco smoke. And we sat there and watched the Royal Variety performance. Went back to bed about 10 o'clock. Think, now nah, I feel fine. It should be okay. And then I've been in bed for about 10 minutes and had the most almighty bout of sneezing. Never experienced anything like it. One of the nurses came to see me to make sure I was okay. And I said, told her about this sneezing bout. And she says, oh, keep fingers crossed. That'll be the only side effect you get. And off she went. Ten minutes later, um, I won't go into the details, but yeah, I was violently ill. And that went on for about eight hours every 20, 30 minutes, by which time the following morning I was completely, utterly exhausted, almost unconscious. And you came on, well, later that day on mm. Monday to yes. take me home. Yes. Needed to be a wheelchair between the bed and the car, which was just outside the hospital door. And um, Dave was clearly in a very reduced state. He could hardly speak, a very grove, croaky voice. Struggled to stand, so fortunately it was a short 20 minute drive from the hospital to home and he just collapsed into bed for a day or so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I thought, well, maybe that was just the first one. So um, the next one I'll probably be okay because I got two years of this every uh, three weeks. and. Uh, I have a photograph here taken just after I got home from that first treatment. One of my daughters will be looking at this now, she'll be cringing. 
And uh, there she is in a nurse's uniform. Um, this is a few days after the first chemotherapy treatment. I was down to about 10 and a half stone now. I think I was six, six foot three. And um, I still got my original hair. That was about to come out a few, few weeks after that. Mm. And um, interesting enough, Claire is now involved, I hope I get this right, with um, um, research and regulations of uh, cancer drugs with a company down in Cambridge. So, um, yeah, really proud of her for doing that. So, <clears throat> went back for the next chemo, yeah, um, home. Um, there, we weren't an inpatient, well, yeah, we had it as an outpatient. We'd go in in the morning, the routine would be blood test, x-rays. If my blood count was okay, then I'd have the chemotherapy straight into the back of the hand that afternoon and then home and I'd just be out of it for about three or four days. And managed to get back to work. And the company I was working for, they, they were absolutely superb in support, financial support. So that's something we didn't have to worry about which was so important and they organized things so I could go to work for two weeks and then have a week off during uh, chemotherapy and they had a big war planner up in the office um, with the year on there and so they could plan things out they marked my chemotherapy week with a black star week um, with little black stars stuck on the war planner and that became known throughout the company then as Dave Harley's Black Star Week. That worked very well mm -hmm. if the blood count wasn't right and everything was put back a week. So I went back into work on the Wednesday then and had to move all the black stars mm -hmm. forward a week. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we dropped into a routine. Yes. Um, Nicely I'll, supported by the company and yeah, neighbours, neighbors, friends and, and family. Friends and so that, that was just a, a very but much appreciated but aspect. There was nobody outside the medical side to go and talk to whatsoever. Um, so we were a little bit mm. on our own on, in that respect. Mm. Um, after a few, well, two or three months of this, um, I have to admit I was starting to struggle and questioned if I could actually get through two years of this. And uh, I had a word with um, Rosie, who was a sister on the chemo suite and uh, had a really good talk with her and uh, she persuaded me to uh, stick at it but I was struggling and then he was reading the paper one Sunday morning found an interesting article. Mm -hmm. uh, the article originated from America where a chap there who'd been suffering with glaucoma had been smoking cannabis and he'd found that the smoking cannabis alleviated quite a lot of his glaucoma symptoms and he was trying to work with medics and the legal system to get this drug authorised also, the article referred to people with multiple sclerosis and the fact that smoking cannabis alleviated some of their symptoms too. Mm. And right at the bottom, there was a little bit saying that smoking cannabis also helped to relieve the symptoms of chemotherapy drugs, particularly nausea. So I suggested that Dave talk to his uh, oncology consultant, Mr. Sockle, about that. And he did. I did, yeah. So, yeah. Right, yeah, that next week I was yes. in for the chemotherapy on Tuesday, usual routine, blood test, x-rays, and I happened to see Dr. Suckle that day. Um, the boss, as they called him, the team around him, everybody, they, I mean, they all called him the boss. He, he was a real character, wasn't he? A lo lo lovely guy. And um, kept in touch with him for many years after as well. And uh, I said, uh, we were reading at the weekend that cannabis might help me. Um, get through the chemotherapy and he sort of looked at me with a grin on his face and he says well I'll prescribe it if you want I thought well I didn't think you'd be saying that and he says um, he says Dave don't misunderstand he says we won't be sat on the floor cross-legged passing silly cigarettes around it's nothing like that they were his very words and he says it's in tablet form and uh, what they actually prescribe is a drug called Navilone I've got definition of it here and yeah it was issued in uh, capsule form I used to take some the day before mm -hmm. chemotherapy um, and then some the day after and then if my blood count was okay then I'd take one directly before the uh, chemotherapy and I think it's still in use today uh, Nab Nabilone was talking to somebody um, on one of the virtual cuppers recently about it let's get rid of that 
It helped. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was still very ill after the treatment, but I was more relaxed and it also helped me relax during the um, actual administration of the drug because this time I was finding it very, very uncomfortable um, with it going into the back of the hand. You could actually feel it going around the body. It's, um, it was a horrible effect. But that, that dropped us into a routine then, yeah. didn't it? Mm -hmm. And um, so because we were on chemotherapy for so long, we looked at trying to set ourselves targets, something to look forward to instead of looking forward to two years hence. And one of those things was a holiday. Let's have a holiday. So. We asked them about going on holiday and they said yes and um, they would work the chemotherapy around it whereabouts are you going and we said well we'd like to go camping in france and italy <laughs> so they said well yeah that's okay france is okay but don't go to italy we don't know why but um, anyway we stayed in france so off we go to the south of france camping and uh, yeah we had a lovely holiday didn't we you did apart from the fact that um here we are in France, well here I am, with mm -hmm. my chemo hat on, two daughters enjoying themselves. Um, I was suffering then with the most awful bout of mouth ulcers, uh, which some of you might know is one of the side effects of chemotherapy. I'd also cracked a rib, but I didn't find out about that until after yes. mm -hmm. I got uh, home from holiday when I had an x-ray. Had I have known how vulnerable or fragile my leg was, we wouldn't have gone. And I was going to find out a few weeks later. So we came back from holiday, been home a few weeks. And one of the neighbors came around and said, fancy a beer. So we're walking into, um, down to the local pub. It's a summer's evening, August the 1st. I remember the day very well. <laughs> and this dog suddenly barked at us. Sounds daft this does. It, sort of alarmed us both and without thinking I put all my weight on my left leg and it was like a there's no noise it was like a thump inside my leg and I knew what had happened and uh, a friend was at the side of me and I put my hand on his shoulder and says help me sit down I think my leg's broken and he thought I was winding him up so I sat on the pavement looked at my thigh and it was shaped like a banana where the muscles are contracted. So off to A&E and uh, gas and air while they straightened it out, put a Thomas splint and I think I was put in traction whilst I was on that. And then there was quite a lot of discussion as what to do. And we found out at a later date that amputation was discussed. Um, but the, the consultant who did the original biopsy and removal of the tumour um, suggested surgery um, using Ender's nails. Now, these photographs, I have to say, this is before digital photography. So these were the days when you took a photograph, sent the film off to TruePrint, waited two weeks for it to come back, mm -hmm. fingers crossed that it actually came out. Um, fortunately, this one did. Now, this photograph was taken quite some years after mm -hmm. after the original surgery. Um, this is the femur here, and this is where the original uh, tumour was. Now, the Ender's nails, basically, they're four titanium rods, and they make an incision either side of the knee, and then they go up the cavity of the bone, and then they're fixed into the top of the femur. And um, that surgery worked, mm. and they I still carry them around in my femur today so <clears throat> i was stuck in bed for a few weeks um couldn't get out then at one point they put my leg in plaster which is a plastic casing which covered the whole femur that had a hinge two hinges one either side yeah, of your knee down to plaster on like a full plaster on my leg and then for walking there was like a plastic cut on the heel um it was heavy it was uncomfortable. You could, I couldn't really sit down comfortably. I could only lie in bed on my back. I couldn't turn over. But anyway, going back to the hospital bed, I think I was stuck in bed for about three weeks in hospital, mm. desperate to get home. And your birthday was coming up and I thought I need to be home for Barbara's birthday. 
and they said you're not going home until you've walked down the corridor and back walked up five steps and down again so I managed to do it I cheated but I didn't tell them that at the time and they allowed me home mm. on your birthday exactly. Barbara came to collect me took me out in a wheelchair then I think you were yeah. taken out in a wheelchair from the ward by a nurse and and the nurse left us with the wheelchair just outside the front of QMC because that's where you could park the car then you can't now of course yeah. however we hadn't anticipated how we'd get into the car we different height to a bed and all the hospital equipment though quite a few other things we hadn't really considered either and uh, we were stood pontificating about how to get Dave in the car and two ambulance chaps came over you know before paramedics in those days but these two guys were great they were good fun weren't they yeah they're good fun because the, the problem was because I'm tall and trying to get down low to get in the car so they're helping me get in the car and I'm hanging on to one of these guys for dear life and they sort of gradually gracefully got me into the back of the car and I sort of rolled onto the back seat at which point I heard this ripping sound. I thought, oh my God, what have you done? <laughs> and I looked in my left hand and I got one of these guys' shirt pockets in my left hand, which I'd held on to and pulled it off as I went in the ambulance. And I felt, I felt awful about it. It says, I'm ever so sorry. And <laughs> they were fine about it. I'm okay. sure they had a laugh about it afterwards. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we, we got home. It was a bit of a struggle, but we soon, soon got used to it because I was off work full-time now mm. again the company were actually they were just superb mm. um kept me on full salary um full use of the car they were brilliant weren't they it was yes and um, back to orthopedic uh, uh, well, fracture fracture, fracture clinic. clinic the bone hadn't healed at all well, there's no new bone growth uh so i was called back two weeks later and this was the story then the bone wasn't growing back um, because the chemotherapy was preventing the bone growth and somebody suggested hypnotherapy which I got reservations about so I went to see this doctor for a course of hypnotherapy two things to help relax during the treatment and basically to get inside your body to imagine the bone growing back now whether it was coincidence I don't know but the next time we went back to fracture clinic celebration because there were signs of new bone growth and eventually they were able to take the plaster off mm -hmm. just before Christmas that year so we're about 15 months into the uh, chemotherapy by now and got back to work the following year we did. I was back at work full-time um, managed to get off crutches onto two walking sticks and then gradually onto one walking stick and little story I need to tell you I'd got some travel vouchers from the company. It was all part of a bonus scheme. So we thought, give ourselves another treat. We've got three more rounds of chemotherapy to go. And we had a short break in the south of France. And uh, we went off this small place called Lelec near Marseille. A lovely hotel. It was out of season, very quiet. There's only a few other people staying there. And some of that day I'd managed to walk around a bit without the walking stick, but evening time I was struggling a bit so I got the walking stick we were, we were first in the restaurant walking stick was under the table and there's four of the couples eating in the restaurant that night one by one it's just surreal as they came in the restaurant each of the blokes had got a walking stick and I thought how surreal is that and it was the same all the break we were on the beach the following day a couple came and sat next to us he got a walking stick mm. And it was almost like a Monty Python it was. sketch, wasn't mm, it? Yes. But anyhow, we had a lovely break mm. without the children, I have to say, no offence. <laughs> and um, we uh, got home November 1985. Mm -hmm. I went for my final chemotherapy. Went back to work the following week. Sat down with my boss just to sort of forward plan and to be given the greeting congratulations Dave you're now cured ah so I thought no I'm not I've only just finished my chemotherapy but that's people's perception of probably cancer you go through the cancer treatment 
you might have finished the treatment but you know there's a long journey ahead mm. and um, that's what most people thought now that I was fully recovered and I was trying to stay positive all the time but I was finding work a struggle mm. and I actually got quite depressed at one point I was um, suggested I went on to antidepressants but for me that was a no-no and then one thing that did help I adjusted your bike one day and mm -hmm. went out for a short bike ride and I never forgot coming or can't forget coming back from that and the adrenaline was was there again and I got into cycling in a big way the year after that or two years we did the great Nottingham bike ride mm -hmm. a 50 mile charity bike ride which um, yeah, that was, a, that was a, an absolutely <laughs> amazing day. And uh, so that was really it. Chemo had finished. I was still going for checkups. Gradually they were spaced out. So it was every uh, few months and so on. I got myself back in the band as well, playing drums, which was really the icing on the cake. Wasn't happy at work. I never really settled back into that uh, job again. And um, I was offered a job elsewhere, same industry, which I took and... I put everything behind me. I didn't really want to talk about it. And if anybody said, oh, have you hurt your leg? I just used to pass it off and just found it very difficult to talk about. And <clears throat> then life, life norm, normal life. A new normal, yes. Just a new normal, normal, yeah. Playing on the back lawn one afternoon. This was 1991, mm -hmm. um, six or seven years after the chemotherapy. And I slipped on the back lawn. Mm. There was a bit of a noise when I went down, wasn't there? There was. I was inside the house and I could hear play outside and I suddenly heard a change in note and a bit of alarm. So I went outside to investigate and there were daughters looking at their dad and he was on the grass. Um, and his left knee had achieved an angle that it hadn't seen for some years. So off we went to hospital. Yeah, back there. So... Back on back into the same ward, I've been there for the biopsy, um, the, the fracture. So I'm back on the ward again um, for surgery on the knee. It was keyhole surgery. And in fact, the surgeon that did it, mm. claim to fame, was the same surgeon that put Prince Charles's elbow back oh, together yes. after he fell off a horse playing mm. polo. So it was about that time. And anyway, the surgery was done. And I was looking for the letter the other day, but I had his actual description of the surgery, which actually said, um, surgery carried out, knee reassembled, and a lot of gubbins removed. So any medical professionals, the definition of gubbins, I'd like to know what that was, oh. please. Um, back on crutches, mm -hmm. off work for a short time, um, and then back to normal again. Mm. And... <laughs> 1993 it was I took a complete change in my career and changed industries went into the municipal got even say it, municipal, municipal vehicle industry concentrating mainly on bin lorries a really glamorous industry that was but I absolutely loved it and uh, covering Scotland Northern Ireland well all of Ireland Northern England yeah it's really really great and then uh, driving home a year after I joined that industry 1994 and got a tremendous pain in my right hand side lasted for about 20 minutes um got home it happened again and mm. this time i just collapsed with mm. the pain so you managed to get an appointment at uh, an emergency doctor mm -hmm. and this doctor just happened to be a previous member of dr sockle's team my oncology consultant so she knew my history um so this is awareness of bone cancer. She, she knew straight away it needed attention and she called an ambulance off into hospital and it turned out to be a kidney stone, which may or may not have been an effect of the chemotherapy. We, we don't know. Mm. So I was in hospital for about a week with that. Uh, no surgery required. It took its natural course. The key, but that kidney stone was going to be a little bit of a, an issue late, later on in life, which we'll come to um that was okay and then 1995 it would have been mm -hmm. is that right i went for my annual checkup and uh blood test x-ray dr sockle the boss came to see me 
and he's looking, they're looking at my x-rays, he says, how are you feeling? He says, oh, I'm feeling fine, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing a lot of cycling, etc, etc, love work. He says, right, he says, clear off, I don't want to see you in this building ever again. And that was his way of discharging me in 1995. And he said, one thing though, he says, if you go on holiday, I want a postcard from you. I couldn't care less about the weather or what it's like. I want to know any medical issues during that year and also a Christmas card from you. So that carried on for many, many years until uh, he retired. Um, we dropped into another an normal. A normal life, <laughs> another, yet another normal life. And then November 2000, mm -hmm. it's my 50th birthday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We don't do big birthday presents, but I don't know. I had a bit of a surprise. Mm this time I challenged Dave to learn to fly because for a long time he'd been very interested in planes and for a long time he'd wanted to learn to fly so there he was his ticket to learn to fly if he wanted to yeah lucky me after all that so dream come true so off I went local aerodrome only about 20 minutes drive from here to learn to fly to be told that prior to going solo I would need a full medical carried out by civil civil aviation, aviation. authority and, uh, uh, doctor which concerned me somewhat so the appointment was made I went off to see this doctor and very very comprehensive lots of forms and paperwork which I found out that's typical of aviation anyway mm -hmm. and the medical took about an hour my heart was checked blood was checked everything and um, at the end of it, it says, I think we have a problem. So obviously I'm fearing the worst because I have a history of bone cancer. And he says, no, bone cancer is not an issue. He said, uh, six years ago, you had a kidney stone. And I said, yes. He says, that might be a problem. So there might be a delay on your uh, certificate because I'll have to inquire about it. So anyhow, I did get my certificate issued and he said on the basis that if you ever get another kidney stone your license if you do get your license will be suspended for five years and uh, so I thought well I'll worry about that at the time if it happens anyway July 2002 after seven eight exams plus flying exams I got my flying license and this was the day I actually got my license. Remember that day? I do. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, a, yeah, my license actually arrived that day and I was able to take Barbara flying. And uh, she's looking quite relaxed there. So we now know <laughs> that that was after we'd landed, not before we. <laughs> it was took fine. Off. I was, I think I was more nervous than you at the time. Mm. And, um, and lo and behold, yes, I got another kidney stone a few years later. But um, that, meant flying came to the end plus also we couldn't really afford it anyway but uh, it was it was good fun while it lasted and <clears throat> long-term effects i'd had a couple of varicose vein operations i had awful trouble with varicose veins i had surgery on that mm -hmm. um whether or whether or not that was a good idea we, we don't know do we it, it, it was um, a good idea. but other things Although it was very active about this time, still doing a lot of cycling, been on walking holidays. If I was away um, on business, I'd probably go for a run um, for a couple of miles. But intermittently, I get awful pain in my leg, still do. It affects the whole leg. It's like a burning pain inside. Um, it lasts for about two or three days, and then I'll probably nothing at all for a few weeks. Nerve pain, I know this is quite common with a long term effect of chemotherapy, or more so the radiotherapy than chemotherapy. And the worst is in my big toe, and it's like somebody every 30 seconds sticking a nail in my big toe, and it's like an electric shock that goes through the, the whole body. I had vincristine for two years, and one of the effects of vincristine it makes the finger ends and toes go all tingly and numbly. Numbly, no. <laughs> you know the word anyway. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and um, I still 
never really recovered from that my finger ends are still slightly numb mm -hmm. and i still get this tingling sensation in my uh, toes um <coughs> tinnitus mm -hmm. i found out uh such a bone cancer research trust uh, get together in glasgow last year and there was a discussion there and it seemed everyone there has been through bone cancer chemotherapy had tinnitus mm -hmm. uh, which i suffer from um, I don't know how many of them were drummers in bands though as no, well. No, I played drums in bands sometimes, <laughs> heavy rock for 50 years, so that might have also had something to do with it. Sneezing, I mentioned the sneezing bout mm. I had after my first round of chemotherapy. Every time I had chemotherapy, the first sign that I was going to be ill was a massive bout of sneezing. Mm. I still get those awful bouts of sneezing today, mm. Mm. don't I dear? Yes, very loud yeah. and extended. And Having got to know quite a few other people now involved in the Bone Cancer Research Trust, and other, I, I know not everyone is as lucky as I've been. Mm. And uh, yeah, the guilt thing, it's something you have to live with. Mm. Yeah, and uh, you think, well, you know, why did I come through it? And I've had such a good life and uh, others haven't. And uh, yeah, that's something I have to live with. And then that's almost it. Mm until six years ago mm -hmm. <laughs> we're on holiday in portugal one of barbara's challenges it's got to be a steep hill walk we can't just go for a walk on the beach we have to go up and down steep hills and so on and it's a slightly loose surface slipped slightly felt a twinge where the original tumor was just a minor twinge and thought nothing of it but over the next week or two the pain got worse and worse and i thought I've done something serious here. I went to see the GP, explained my history, told him what I'd done, and he said, go home and do some knee exercises, you've probably strained your knee. And I was hobbling on a walking stick, and he says, get rid of your walking stick, you don't need that. Okay. Um, went back to the GP again, mm -hmm. and um, he organized an x-ray. The result of that, I got referred to oncology at the city hospital to see a Mr. Perks, Mr. Perks yeah. super guy. And uh, he sort of apologised that it might have caused us some alarm being referred to oncology. Which it had. <laughs> which it had, of course. But he said, we specialise in lumps and bumps, basically on bones. And you've got lots of lumps and bumps on your femur. Um, but... On closer examination, there's nothing sinister there, and I suggest that you've had a stress fracture. <clears throat> Fortunately, the ender's nails are still there supporting the leg. Without those, I think it would have been a full fracture. But again, two visits to the GP before anything actually happened, in spite of my history. <clears throat> I also noticed that I was losing a lot of flexibility in my ankle, walking awkwardly, and I was dragging my foot on the floor. And I was then diagnosed with what they call foot drop and given a brace which basically fits around the lower leg and hooks onto the shoe to help me lift my foot up when I'm walking. Hate the thing, very uncomfortable and uh, try to walk as much as I could without it. That came back to bite me one morning. It was a Sunday morning I'm walking home four years ago, four or five years ago and tripped because of my foot drop I had a very bad fall uh somebody brought me home uh you dialed i can never remember if it's 111 or 101 one of the two anyway <clears throat> described the symptoms i sent a paramedic out i was diagnosed with two cracked ribs internal bruising cuts and bruises and i tried to tell this guy that i think i might have fractured my femur because it was very very painful and he says well you can stand on it it's unlikely so that was put to one side, um, back to the GP mm -hmm. and again, mm. and eventually I got referred to an orthopaedic consultant um, who examined my leg, got it x-rayed and suggested an MRI scan. I had the MRI scan early the following year, so this is like four, four or five months after this fall. Went back for the results on the scan and sat down. It was quite abrupt, this mm. guy. 
And he said, I'm very concerned, Mr. Harley, about the results of your scan. And I said, what do you mean? I says, has the cancer come back? And he says, I'm afraid it's looking like that. And I says, well, I didn't think it would reoccur in the same spot. And he says, well, I'm not an expert, I wouldn't know, but I'm going to organise an urgent referral to um, Birmingham Royal Orthopaedic Hospital. Great bunch of people, weren't they? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> in fact, they, one of the consultants there phoned me up two or three days before we went uh, just to talk through uh, things. So we got there, we saw Mr. Abadou, Abadou, apologies for the pronunciation. And uh, another x-ray was taken at the time. And the good news was nothing sinister and it turned out to be yet another stress fracture. That's something probably now I'm uh, going to uh, have to live with. And uh, as a result of that, I was then referred to a consultant about foot drop. Mm -hmm. Went in to see this consultant back at the Queen's Medical Centre in Nottingham. And his first words were, he says, gosh, I've never met anyone before who's had Ewing sarcoma. He says, tell me all about it. And this guy was just absolutely fascinated. And I think a 10 minute consultation, <laughs> probably there for about an hour. Mm -hmm. And he offered three options to, uh, with a foot drop, two involved surgery, one involved physiotherapy. He sent me away to make my own mind up and I said, I don't want any more surgery. And he says, you made the right decision because there'd be a risk because your leg's so compromised, any more surgery on that leg and you'd probably lose your foot or even the leg. So, uh, mm. We had physiotherapy, which I still do some, but yes, I st st still have to wear the brace now, but um, it's probably a small, mm. small price to pay. So that pretty much brings up to, up to date, but by this time, we're starting to find out a bit more about bone cancer, how serious it was through the internet. And uh, I was putting postings on a Ewing sarcoma survivor site on Facebook which was predominantly patients uh, over in the States. And uh, I got, yeah, made me feel quite good putting postings on there, sort of advice and helping. And through that, I got to find out about a project being held down in Southampton, Jess, uh, Jessica. Jessica Bate. Mm. Um, and uh, they were putting together a national Ewing's multidisciplinary team. And they were looking for survivors, patients and relatives, etc., to give their input, in, in, input into Ewing sarcoma. So off I went down to London on the train, got to this meeting and met up with this guy who'd also had Ewing sarcoma many years ago. And that was the first time in all those years I'd ever met face to face with somebody else who'd had, who'd had Ewing sarcoma. We both got the same type of brace for the foot drop. And uh, for me, it was quite, quite an emotional, an emotional and sur surreal day. And uh, we got in the meeting and for the first time ever, I was able to sit, just talk briefly about what I've been through. I think it was Zoe Davison. I'm not sure, but I apologize if I got it wrong, was there from the Bone Cancer Research Trust, got talking to Zoe. And as a result of that, got involved with the uh, Bone Cancer Research Trust. Uh, I think we've met most of the staff now. We've mm -hmm. been to two conferences, absolutely amazing events. And um, we had the privilege one year to visit the research laboratories in Leeds. Um, Professor Sue Burchill was there um, doing research into Ewing sarcoma. And uh, that was just amazing what goes into that. And it really made me understand how important the funding is that Bone Cancer Research Trust uh, raised to that. Mm. And <clears throat> the passion and dedication yeah, that the was, teams have got in the labs just is just wonderful, phenomenal. wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I have to get this plug in. Um, Bone Cancer Research Trust, in fact, it's Louise and Joanne, they did a Bone Cancer Awareness Day last year at Maggie's Support Centre in Nottingham. So um, we went along there. It was mm. last year, wasn't it? it yeah, was, that, yeah, last year. Nearly a year ago. Uh, and, um, and I got talking to uh, another cancer patient uh, there and um, 
he was asking a bit about my history and he says, why don't you come along to our men's support group? <laughs> I said, well, I'm not actually poorly. He says, no, it doesn't matter, come along. He says, you get a bacon sandwich and a coffee when you get here. So I thought, yeah, we'll go along for that. So I've been going to uh, Maggie's on a regular basis now. Zoo, obviously, they're mostly Zoom meetings now, but and I found that mm. a real help because it's it's just just good, good to talk. I would say. And there's a chance to play drums again with some of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Out of the few that go along there, yeah, two guitarists, a bass player, and myself a drummer. So we did do a few numbers at uh, last Christmas for them. So I'm really looking forward to uh, yeah get, get, getting back in the band again. So. I think we're there, but I've got to say a big, big thank you to mm -hmm. Bone Cancer mm -hmm. Research Trust. They um, absolutely great marvellous. Mm. And um, yeah, it's been a tough year for everybody this year, but um, I'm going to say it while they're there, but the, the virtual couplers, it's, um, <laughs> we can't miss them on a Wednesday. Well, we missed it yesterday because we invited out for lunch. Apologies. But yeah, but th thank you very much. And yeah, thank you for giving, you know, giving me the opportunity. Oh, sorry, also the opportunity <laughs> to do this. And yeah, my final point, um, I always say this, in some ways I'm glad I came, went through it because we've had a good life. Um, life might have turned out differently. Mm. And I always say all I really had to do was suffer. Um, it was you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> Yeah, you had a hard life, didn't you? Not me. So thank you very much, everybody. Yes. Thank oh, thank you so much. That was just brilliant. Absolutely. Amazing day. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Well done. Well it's done. Really, really good. And some of the things that you talk about, you know, you can't believe the fact the only treatment was through your cannula. That seems just archaic. Yeah. The fact that after with your history, you still had to go back to your GP several times when you're having problems with your leg. That just seems crazy, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, that was just just wonderful thank you so much um now i've just got a question for you if this is okay um you said in your talk that when you were diagnosed there was no information or very very little information there certainly was no support there was no maggie's there was no macmillan's there was no bone cancer research trust how do you think your experiences would have been different if you if you know now and had the support now when you got your diagnosis 37 years ago i think it would have been different um one thing i'm always wary of is the internet um you know you can have a minor a minor headache you go on the internet and within half an hour you've probably got to you know a, a brain a, 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 yeah a brain tumor um but what if we'd have had somebody like yourselves Macmillan, Maggie's, whatever, just to go and talk it through and find out a bit about it mm -hmm. um yes it certainly would have been valuable in some ways though contradicting myself the lack of knowledge probably i didn't realize how seriously ill i was because i think the survival rate even now is what 50 60 percent mm -hmm. so that nobody really gave us any figures or anything like no. that in fact mike sockle the oncology consultant he said i'm not going to deal in figures we did later discover of course that um ewing sarcoma and bone polyp cancer in particular are not very good for survival rates are they i think one of the things that i discovered through searching because i'm always interested in finding out information about things i'm involved with um was the fact that ewing sarcoma was largely attributed to affecting younger people mm. and here's me thinking that dave had been suffering with this since he was a youngster and i'm considering that it's manifested itself in awful ways mm. I would have known different with your yeah. support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean the, the the medical team we had, everybody um used to call her Margaret the Blood Lady, who, yeah. who lives not far from us. Um, yeah. Mm. And um it, it was just like one big team. They were absolutely wonderful, but of course they were busy. So you couldn't really um it was never a time really to to ask things or indeed to even think about what you needed to know yeah, yeah. although you know we had a close relationship R rosie who was the sister on the chemo suite she administered my chemotherapy for most of that two years hated the sight of her she made me feel ill <laughs> sorry rosie <laughs> but um 
<laughs> we became good friends afterwards mm. and we mm. kept in touch and uh, even still today all these years on we still ex mm. we still write letters to one another at christmas mm. so yeah it's that sort of relationship but mm. um definitely mixed feelings about whether yeah yeah the information would have been mm. yeah yeah obviously the support would have been appreciated wouldn't it yeah but it's almost like you you you're happy in your ignorance a bit yeah you no know, yeah yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just had a question. Well, a comment from Bettina. She was just saying. So your chemo, it was you had one day every three weeks. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think the, 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 the drug, the drugs I know were I had our doxorubicin, uh, I phosphamide and vincristine, and there were others as well. Um, the routine was the injection or infusion was done on a Tuesday afternoon. And then it will be three weeks um, before I got the next one, mm. assuming my blood count came up okay for the next round. I think that only happened two or three times where it had to be uh, mm. delayed. Do the doxorubicin, I mean, that's horrible, it's e evil stuff. That was every other treatment. So, and that finished after the first year. So, I think I worked out probably I had eight doses of uh, doxorubicin. Um, but yes, it was done as an inpatient, so, uh, outpatient. Sorry, outpatient, sorry, <laughs> get that right. And um, it wasn't a communal room, it was like a small waiting area where, where we would sit and chat. And then you'd sit there and then you'd see pharmacists coming with a big pile of, what's the word I'm looking for? Mm, Syrian <laughs> Yeah, yeah the, the, the syringes. syringes. I, never, I didn't realise they made syringes that big and um then your name was called and uh, yeah it was quite a horrific experience going in for the chemo it mm. was uncomfortable mm. um but yeah i've done it <laughs> yeah and as bettina says two years that's yeah. a big chunk of your life to be undergoing treatment isn't it yeah yeah mm. yeah well, I, th I believe i'm i mean touch me if i can sit, see him on the screen um another long-term survivor Long with me, you'll always add. <laughs> Hi, John. <laughs> I know you trumped me back three years, man. <laughs> um, I think he, he also, he, I think he had uh, two, two years of chemotherapy as well. Yeah, administered just, just like mine. But I do recall them saying, because we were Nottinghamshire, it was only a year in Derbyshire. I'm sure mm, somebody some, said that at one some point. Some difference, different okay. centres. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. I think Ruth Flanagan says she'd just like to say hi. You can unmute yourself if you want to, Ruth. Yeah, of course. Mm. That's it. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. it's fine, yeah. yeah. Hi, Ruth. Hi, oh, yeah. I'd like to say hi, Dave. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know who else is on him, and I've had a bit of the involvement with BCRT, but. Um, I'm 26 years post having my treatment for Ewing, so mine was in my pelvis. Right, yeah. Okay. Um, and I've had a lot, like you have, but very differently, had a lot, a lot of complications yeah. since then. And I'm really looking for ways to sort of connect with longer term survivor people because i feel so kind of out on a on my own mm. and i see all these sort of groups for young cancer groups but they're very much talking about lots of the issues that i've already been through they're more in the mm. midterm phase mm -hmm. whereas i've dealt with late effects and fertility and other complications so I was wondering if you know of any group or does BCRT know of any long, long term survivor yeah. by cancer people that get together? I don't I don't necessarily want to sort of talk about. I just want to know how everyone is doing and yeah. and I don't want to talk too much about all the depressing stuff that happened but just somebody that kind of gets it mm. well if um when you pull your resources often it makes things a bit easier to solve and get through doesn't it 
yeah. must yeah. be what yeah. you're after. So you've been through the late effects areas and I, 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 I know what he's saying I, I just just going back to when I met that guy with Ewing's for the first time yeah <laughs> I went down to London um yeah that was just just absolutely amazing and I've got to know J John who I know is um watching this and um uh self and John we meet up occasionally difficult during lockdown mm. and uh, go and have a coffee and uh, you know a really good chat not necessarily about bone cancer but all sorts of things um but um going to get a plug now for the virtual cuppers <laughs> yeah, yeah that whenever you went it's wednesday wednesday afternoons, wednesday afternoons uh, mm -hmm. during lockdown there's been a zoom meeting there and when they started those off i i did say well look you know it's a long time since i had bone cancer um, so can I just listen in and if necessary if somebody asks me something then I'll I'll contribute but it's not like that they're um, yeah they go around and see how everybody is but we have a really good chat don't we and mm -hmm. it's um, we well we missed we missed it yesterday because we were invited out for lunch a free lunch <laughs> and um, we wouldn't have missed that normally, we, uh, no. normally mm -hmm. because uh, mm -hmm. we really look forward to them and I find them valuable um sounds like an avenue to explore Ruth. yeah, yeah. Ma Ma Mag maggie's are good mm. I, I i go along to that um it's more like a social get together but there's nobody else there with bone cancer mm. so you you so, sort of on your own but uh, you, you can talk about how cancer affects your life and so on yeah but i think it's, it's more because so, I think, I mean, I, it's such a major, major part of your life. Like I, I had it when I was 15 and it's such a major part of your life. And it's totally, I view my life as in before cancer and after cancer kind of thing. It just puts a complete divide down everything. So I'd kind of, I'd, I'd really like to sort of, just speak to some other bone cancer long-term survivors and just maybe just to not just feel so lonely maybe there's no sort of other you know you know i've got plenty of other support but just somebody that understands mm -hmm. yeah I, I, when we've finished i mean uh either joe or louise can get some contact details and yeah, obviously them anyway and talk, yeah. talk to them but um mm. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, we'll do. And I think, um, uh, yeah. is it Joff? John. It? John, John, John. Oh, it, yeah. it says Joff. Yeah, no, John, John's put on something as well. So I think that might be good for you all to connect and have a chat, maybe. Yeah, and just see if there's anyone else out there that's sort of floating around and. Yeah. At a loose end. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've yeah. got your email sense. address, Ruth. So if you don't, we could pass that on to Dave and John okay, if that's easy. okay with you. And perhaps you could meet up, connect somehow. Yes. That'd be fab, yeah. And fair. maybe maybe something maybe a bit more with BCRT yes, too. Of yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, something, something that you look into. Yeah. And so I feel sorry, Ruth, go on. It's it's still it's still really important to to have that i think absolutely. even though it was so long ago oh, of course yeah, yeah. absolutely that experience is part of you and it always will be um so that's something we can certainly look into but in the in the short term we can connect you with john and dave and barbara um and then we can look <laughs> to do some something more formal with bcrt try and get more people involved yeah. Um, Andy says, try the virtual cup on Wednesdays. We are all very friendly. Oh, we are very friendly. <laughs> honest, honest, Ruth. It's very, it, they're really good. It's really relaxed. Yeah. It is. It yeah. is. And that's something we never wanted to create a, a formal event where people felt they had to contribute or they had to share certain things. It really isn't like that. And I think as well, although we put it out to current patients, it is as much for, for those who've come through it as well. And really all we try to do is to create community. And you said, you know, sometimes it can be lonely, of course. And that's something we try to reduce as well. The isolation of, of the disease. 
-hmm. so you know you're always welcome you're always welcome absolutely thank you okay thank you you've had some lovely comments though dave and barbara um yeah. leanne had to log off but she said she'd really enjoyed your talk and uh, tracy said isn't it strange how we remember dates and food etc when major things happen to us shepherd's pie smiley face no, no. um it, yeah it was a many many years until i could face shepherd's pie and you know oh. we've come back from holiday we've been to france off the ferry and we stopped at some a friend's house for a meal on the way back and what was on the menu? Yeah, and she said, um, Shepherd's Pie. And I went, oh, oh, it's, a, it's a lovely lady, but she's one of these ladies who's very panics a bit. Yes. Mm. And um, she doesn't ever want to offend. And if she thinks she's done something to offend, she would be absolutely mortified. So that was, that was the first time I ate Shepherd's Pie after many, many years. But he did it and survived <laughs> without a sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> and Val said thank you so much Dave and Barbara for sharing your story I especially appreciated your comment on survivor's guilt mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It's in, in, yeah and that didn't really until I found out more about it and met up with other people and got to know mm. um, a bit more about it yeah mm. yeah it's there Absolutely. yeah were there any more questions anyone wanted to put to Dave or Barbara before we tie everything up Thanks, John. Hope to speak soon. Fab. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, hopefully meet up then, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's um, great. The whole point of doing things like this is to connect yeah. people and yeah. make people not feel so isolated. Mm. So I think if there's no more questions, um, all that's left to say is thank you so much once again to Dave and Barbara for that wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, really really appreciated it um the next webinar is actually on the 18th of november which is a wednesday yes 1 p.m um and it's with sarah dransfield who is i think it's osteosarcoma lou yes survivor yeah. who has a uh, an above the knee amputation and she's going to be talking about self-image and getting back into dating and all the things that are associated with a change in, in your body and the way that you look so it should Absolutely. be really interesting yeah. Um, so hopefully we'll see some of you there if you can make it but uh, thank you for joining us today thank you guys thank you, thank you bye bye, bye. bye.